Suppose I stood in front of the class and said, here's a thousand dollar bill. Who'd like to have it? You and everyone else in the room would promptly say, or at least think, me. Suppose I'd then say, okay, we'll hold an election. The person who wins get the most votes gets the money. What would happen if the election were, was held immediately? It is likely that each member of the class would vote for himself or herself. A few might vote for a friend. Almost certainly, however, the election would end in a tie. No one would win the money. But suppose I said, we'll hold an election tomorrow. What do you think would happen then? As you think about the answer to that question, you begin to get a sense of the practical importance of the nominating process, the first step in the process of electing candidates to office. The nominating process is the process of candidate selection. Nomination, or the naming of those who will seek office, is a critically important step in the election process. You have already seen two major illustrations of the significance of the nomination process. In Chapter 5, we talked about the making of nominations. One is a primary function of political parties in the United States, and secondly, as a leading reason for the decentralized character of the two major parties. The nominating process also has a very real impact on the exercise of the right to vote. In the typical election in this country, voters can make only one of two choices for each office on the ballot. They can vote for Republican or they can vote for the Democratic candidate. This is another way of saying that we have a two-party system in the United States. It is also another way to say that the nominating stage is a critically important part of the elect electoral process. Those who make nominations place those who make nominations place real, very practical limits on the choices that voters can make in an election. One-party constituencies, those areas where one party regularly wins elections, the nominating process is usually the only point in which there's any real contest for a public office. Once the dominant party has made its nomination, the general election is little more than a formality. Dictatorial regimes point up the importance of the nominating process. Many of them hold general elections or regularly scheduled elections at which voters make the final selection of office holders, much as democracies do. But typically the ballots used in those elections list only one candidate for each office, the candidate of the ruling clique, and those candidates regularly win with majorities approaching 100%. There are five ways in which nominations are made in the United States, and tonight and tomorrow night we will be looking at those. They include self-announcement, caucus, conventions, the direct primary, and the petition. We're going to start with the self-announcement. Self-announcement is the oldest form of the nominating process in American politics. First used in colonial times, it is often found at the smallest, in the small town and rural levels in many parts of the country. The method is quite simple. A person who wants to run for office simply announces that fact. Modesty or local custom may dictate that someone, must, someone else must make the candidate's announcement, but still, the process accounts to the same thing. Self-announcement is sometimes used by someone who failed to win a regular party nomination or by someone unhappy with the party's choice. Note that whenever a write-in candidate appears in an election, the self-announcement process has been used. In recent history, four prominent presidential contenders have made use of the process. George Wallace, who declared himself to be an American Independent Party's nominee in 1968, and, and, and independent candidates Eugene McCarthy in 1976, John Anderson in 1980, and Ross Perot in 1992. All of the 135 candidates who sought to replace Governor Gray Davis of California in that state's recall election in 2003, including the winner, Arnold Schwarzenegger, were self-starters. The next group we're going to look at is the caucus. As a nominating device, a caucus is a group of like-minded people who meet to select the candidates they will support in an upcoming election. The first caucus nominations were made during the later colonial period, probably in Boston in the 1720s. John Adams described the caucus this way in 1763. This day learned that the caucus club meets at certain times in the garret of Tom Dawes, the adjunct of Boston Regiment. He has a large house and has a movable partition in his garret, which he takes down, and the whole club meets in one room. There they smoke tobacco till you cannot see from one end of the garret to the other. There they will drink flip, I suppose, and they choose a moderator who puts questions to the vote regularly and select men. Assessors, collectors, wardens, fire wards, and represent representatives are regularly chosen before they are chosen in the town. Originally, the caucus was a private meeting consisting of a few influential figures in the community. As political parties appeared in the late 1700s, they soon took over the device and began to broaden the membership of the caucus. The coming of independence, independence brought need to nominate candidates for state offices, governor, lieutenant governor, and others above the local level. 
the Legislative Caucus, a meeting of a party's member of the, in the state legislature, took on the job. At the national level, both the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans in Congress were, by 1800, choosing their presidential and vice presidential candidates through the Congressional Caucus. The legislative and congressional caucuses were quite practical in their day. Transportation and communication were difficult at best, since legislators already gathered regularly in a central place. It made sense for them to take on the nominating responsibility. The spread of democracy, especially in the newer states on the frontier, spurred opposition to caucuses. However, more and more people condemned them for their closed, unrepresentative character. Criticism of the caucus reached its peak in the early 1820s. The supporters of the three leading contenders for the presidency in 1824, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, and John Quincy Adams, boycotted the Democratic-Republicans' congressional caucus that year. In fact, Jackson and his supporters made King Caucus a leading campaign issue. The other major aspirant, William H. Crawford of Georgia, became the caucus nominee at a meeting attended by fewer than one-third of the Democratic-Republican Party's member in co members in Congress. Crawford ran a poor third in the Electoral College balloting in 1824, and the reign of King Caucus at the national level was ended. With its death in presidential politics, the caucus system soon withered at the state and local levels as well. The caucus is still used to make local nominations in some places, especially in New England. There is a caucus... They are a caucus is open to all members of a party, and it only faintly rep resembles the original closed and private process. Next, we're going to look at the convention. As the caucus method collapsed, the convention system took its place. The first national convention to nominate a presidential candidate was held by a minor party, the Anti-Masons in Baltimore in 1831. The newly formed National Republican, soon to become Whig Party, also had a convention later in the same year. The Democrats picked up the practice in 1832, and all major party presidential nominees have been chosen by conventions ever since. By the 1840s, convention had become the principal means for making nominations at every level in American politics. On paper, the convention process seems perfectly suited to the representative government. A party's member meets in a local caucus to pick candidates for local offices and at the same time to select delegates to represent them at a county convention. At the county convention, the delegates nominate can candidates for county offices and select delegates to the next rung on the convention ladder, usually the state convention. There, the delegates from the county conventions pick the party's nominees for governor and other statewide offices. State conventions also send delegates to the party's national convention where the party selects its presidential and vice presidential candidates. In theory, the will of the party's rank and file membership is passed up through each of its representative levels. Practice soon pointed to the weaknesses of the theory, however, as party bosses found ways to manipulate the process. By playing with the electoral by playing with the selection of delegates, usually at the local levels, they soon dominated the entire system. As a result, the caliber, caliber of most conventions declined at all level, especially during the late 1800s. Many people had hailed the change from caucus to convention as a major change for the better in American politics. The abuses of the new device soon dashed their hopes. By the 1870s, the convention system was itself under attack as a major source of evil in American politics. By the 1910s, the direct primary had replaced the convention in most states as the principal nominating method in American politics. Conventions still play a major role in the nominating process in some states, notably Connecticut, Michigan, South Dakota, Utah, and Virginia. And as you will see, no adequate substitute for the device has yet been found at the presidential election. So the direct primary, we're going to start talking about that tonight, and we'll finish it up tomorrow night. So a direct primary is an intra-party election. It is held within a party to pick that party's candidates for the general election. Wisconsin adopted the first statewide direct primary law in 1903. Several other states soon followed its lead, and every state now makes, its, makes at least some provision for its use. In most states, state law requires that the majority parties use the primary to choose their candidates for the United States Senate, Senate and House of Representatives for the governorship and all other state offices, and for most local offices as well. In few states, however, different combinations of convention and primary are used to pick candidates for the top offices. In Michigan, for example, the major parties choose their candidate for the U.S. Senate and House, the governorship, and the state legislature and primaries. Nominees for lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and attorney general are picked by conventions. Although the primaries are party-nominating elections, they are closely regulated by law in most states. The state usually sets the dates on which primaries are held, and, it's regular, and it regularly conducts them, too. The state, not the parties, provides polling places and election officials, registration lists and ballots, and other policies to the process. 
There are two basic forms of the direct primary, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, the closed primary and the open primary. The major difference between the two lies in the answer to the question. Who can vote in a party's primary? Only qualified voters who are party members or any qualified member, which we will answer tomorrow. Okay, now I need you to go back to classjump.com and answer the question. For what reason is the making of nominations so important in the electoral process? So answer that question, and I will see you tomorrow in class.